I joined that. So there was a band before, but it wasn't, you know, uh, if Sars remember Jonas could only would only play downstrokes on the pick, he couldn't, couldn't go back and forth, you know. Oh, it's just uh, down. Like, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you being here, man. I'm super excited to hear your your story. So, first mm. off, talk to me about where where were you, you guys are from Sweden, correct? Correct. Talk to me about uh, what what part of Sweden and where were you born and raised? Uh, I was born in a place called Lindome, which is a part of Mundal, which is right outside of Gothenburg, so on the west coast, southwest. Okay. We we think we're in the middle of Sweden, but we are very very far south. Actually. Okay. <laughs> population density wise, I guess Gothenburg is in, you know, there's a belt of high population density between Gothenburg and Stockholm that uh-huh. we down south feel is the middle, but then there is a whole lot of Sweden going on up north, you know. But just not a, a lot more rural area and just not a lot of people up well, there. Or what? No, well, the, well, yeah, less, less dense, you know. Gotcha. For sure. But then, you know, there are proper cities all the way up, but just. You start to feel like you know your closest neighbor is uh, ten miles away. He's around the corner. You know, <laughs> that's a bit far. Mm. <laughs> well, then, how did you get into music? Well, hmm. I um, we we buy uh, we buy a, an electric piano when I'm pretty little, like maybe four years old or something, mm-hmm. and. Uh, Shortly after that, we all, all, me and my two older siblings and some other kids in the neighborhood, we get piano lessons uh, for a while. And uh, so that's the first thing I play. And I think I had, you know, I, I was drawn to it as a to a piano before I sat down with a teacher there, just want, try, wanting to figure out what was going on, kind of you know, putting my fingers there, coming in, I was kind of quote unquote yeah. right writing music before i knew how to play music just it was like a, a toy that i was very drawn to okay and, you know and then lessons and uh, a general music interest based on what my we know what i heard in the house growing up first and foremost i think it was classical music mm-hmm. from my parents and i thought it's i thought being a conductor i probably saw one on tv that i was very cool so i would pretend yeah. that i was one in front of my baby uh, sister little sister was a babe at the time um so it's always around it's always there it's something i you know it's something i do as play time and i'm, uh, I'm also given lessons mm-hmm. uh I, and then you know then at some point i'm I guess i'm six years old or something when my brother gets dangerous by michael jackson the cd on his birthday and and black and white is on TV all the time, as far as I remember. Oh, yeah. You know, like Michael Jackson is there, and a few years later, something else is on TV that then, you know, triggers my dad to show us uh, the Beatles. Oh, okay. And that's when I'm eight years old, and that's probably when I, when you know, I get hooked to the, you know, all those seeds planted of, you know. Play, wanting to play, wanting to come up with your own music, mm-hmm. wanting to be in a band and all that. It kind of starts there. Then it takes a couple of years of discovering heavy metal and and getting a bit older before it all crystallizes for real, you know. But I sure. I feel like the whole the Beatles thing and already having, you know, knowing how to play, I don't know, Twinkle Little Star on piano and all those little things in a row, it kind of helps building yeah. that path. What was the first like? How did you get into metal? Was it what was the first like introduction that you heard, or what drew you to it? Uh, I guess there's a couple of things around a similar time frame that happens. Like a childhood friend of mine, uh, his parents are. I wonder if they are like a decade younger than my than my parents. Meaning that you know, instead of the Beatles, it was something from the seventies. So okay. in that household, uh, you know, I. I guess you know kiss existed and maybe cc top or something you know a couple of things like that so a bit longer hair a bit wilder than dad's music you know that kind of thing that was one thing happening uh and uh, that leads uh, it's in that house where i hear black sabbath for the first time for sure okay and specifically it was from the the Osman Cometh compilation album that they had there. And it was, it was some 
demo tape a rehearsal tape recording of it so it's even more primitive even more wow. lo-fi and creepy it's uh and weird and i didn't like it immediately but it did something to me so that kind of old school stuff happens in that house and you, know, mm -hmm. you get deep purple and everything it kind of triggering point over there and at the same time you know same older brother as before he starts to get into uh the european power metal thing that had a resurgence at the time like i'm 12 this is or something this is around this is late 90s and you know hammerfall had come out with a couple of one or two albums and that created a huge resurgence where all all the kids suddenly liked stuff from the 80s and whatnot so sure. in that environment and specifically well halloween and blind guardian and i would say halloween first uh of Blank Guardian, just shortly after, kind of started a thing of like, okay, I'm not cutting my hair anymore. And then it's just, <laughs> you know, and then it's, so it's between these things, you know, then it solidifies with, in my case specifically, especially Black Sabbath. And then it's, then I'm a teenager and I make, you know, and find friends with common interests in school. And in those uh, three years, so I guess what you would call junior high kind of, it's mm -hmm. just, uh, you know, that's all the death metal, black metal, obscure stuff. And, you know, whatever, you know, like all of that starts happening with 14, 15 and keeps going, you know, up mm -hmm. until today. Uh, <laughs> but that's between friends. They start to put a timeline. I don't remember if I heard The Crown or uh, right. Shadow Bottom first, you know. Sure, uh, sure. But around that but time it, is when you yeah. started to listen to, I mean, you remember Black Sabbath, right? I mean, and the, hearing mm. those bands the first time at your, at yeah, your friend's exactly. house and that kind of. Yeah pave the the way to the heavier and heavier bands yeah exactly and uh i guess death metal got to me probably like through a friend i guess introduced to you know these i get this gang of kids the group of kids who are into giants and dragons and uh a friend he has an electric bass and uh, listens to all the death metal bands and at some point after hanging out there for a while i get to borrow a stack of 10 cds so like, okay. and, but we were listening to that while playing the, you know, the tabletop the role-playing games, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so I don't know in which order I heard what, you know, uh, right. but in that pile of stack of 10, when I went home to my mm -hmm. own room and did the homework, immolation, closer world below was very important to me. Um, okay. I think you put hard work by carcass there, uh, and uh, a bit more less talked about today, I guess the impaled and the oh, dead, I love yeah, the impaled dead, is dope. Dead I shall about dead them. remain. Yeah, dead shall dead remain was in there. Uh, Gorguts Obscura was there. Um, well, I remember because immolation with immolation it clicked for me for real. It's okay. one of those things because you know if you go from Halloween to immolation, there's some via mega death. You know, was a big deal right. to me uh, at times. Well. But this kind of, or you can't even hear what they sing. Or that's the stupid things a kid would say. But in Malaysian, <laughs> you you could hear what he sang. Uh -huh. So that 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 didn't work anymore. And suddenly, oh oh, okay, now I get it. And then suddenly I start to hear it in a different way, you mm -hmm. know. And put my I don't know, I opened for it. And in that group of friends was another friend who also lent me a stack of ten CDs, but with black metal, you know. So that shortly after and. There was Marduk's Dose of the Unlight, I think was, again, the one where it clicked for me. Mm -hmm. But there were more, you know, also your more typical classics that people talk about today all the time, like Transylvanian Hunger and... Uh, uh, Cradle of Filth? Uh, no, uh, the uh, Dark Throne. Oh, and, okay. Uh, What's there and uh, what, uh, Dissection. But I don't, in not the song Berlin, but the other one, uh, first track, Night's Blood is called uh, well that one anyway okay. uh you know stuff stuff like that was on there so i got a very intense crash course in extreme music and you know then again brother and friends swedish west coast in flames blah blah, 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 blah all of that uh and in particular see i'm mis mixing up the timeline but it's all good the haunted was okay. very important there to make everything fall into place and still especially when meeting so i'm already i'm turning 16 when i meet the band uh, when we you know join avatar when i join avatar and all that and was by that, avatar happening all, 
was that already going on when when you joined or what nah, did you so kind of form it together it was happening but it wasn't happening like it's uh so john and jonas had started a band called lost soul together with other friends and you know there's a revolving door of people in and out of this uh thing and it kind of to get rid of some people say we're gonna you know disband the group and stop paying for the rehearsal room and then they came back next week just the two of them named themselves avatar and tried again you know mm -hmm. and i i joined at that so there was a band before but it wasn't you know uh if source remember jonas could only it would only play downstroke so when the pick he couldn't, couldn't go back and forth you know oh it's and, just down like, well, yeah, yeah <laughs> we are we are all green as hell so you know like there's nothing really to so so uh, so we were yeah novices all of us um in doing metal because like i had had those piano lessons as a little kid and then you know that uh you know that after school activity instrument for me as a kid i, I played at the trombone and had picked up the guitar at some point along the way at least a little bit jonas his his it's trombone so to speak that was the piano that he was playing as a kid growing up as well uh henrik who joined you know joined a bit later was clarinet and john the flute you know this after school thing kids would do meaning so there was a whole lot of music already but mm -hmm. then it was like this I, I fucking love the haunted oh so do i and, and then trying to figure out what that even meant and how to tune uh, down a guitar and you know like okay. so beginners in that sense but pretty musical fairly musical kids nevertheless you know and was that in high like high school years when you guys yeah. formed? yeah we would uh so jonas and john would be before that and yeah is it called grade school i'm always confused how to yeah, well, trans jun junior high or whatever you know <laughs> right, up right. Until ninth grade 15 years old jonas and john are 14 and 15. okay and then uh, sweden that we have is the kind of high school is the gymnasium and you join that when you start that when you're 16 and it's the last three years of school kind of before at college or, or university or whatever or or go to jail or whatever <laughs> and, going to jail. <laughs> but, you know, so and uh yeah it's and in this in the holidays between uh before starting gymnasium that's when i get introduced to jonas and john and join the band and the year after when jonas is one year younger when he heads off to gymnasium that is where he meets henrik and simon who are then the final whether you know the actual avatar mark one would <laughs> before you know yes there were two two songs and 10 covers before that and two two battle of advanced losses or whatever you know before that uh, but it's with the, us five where it's a band who practices all the time and writes songs and record demos and and borrows almost car to go and play somewhere eventually gets signed and do the first three albums together and simon is kind of on the way out between album three and four Mm -hmm. for being black waltz uh but he's there still to he's there when recording it but his heart is not really there and shortly after he leaves and tim joins and you know and that's been mark to be going for over a decade now i guess or exactly a decade maybe a decade sure. yeah yeah yeah, yeah yeah and you guys have put a lot of music out within the last you know over the decade mm -hmm. yeah that's uh that's what we do <laughs> uh, i guess yeah well um when did you like when when did you guys start playing your first shows are you still in high school age yeah uh yes i have to yeah exactly uh maybe is jonah still in ninth grade maybe and the other guys but me and john would be do our first year um in the gymnasium so yeah but and those are like band competitions or youth center events kind of there was a lot of that there still is if uh, you know but less kids are doing bands nowadays i guess as opposed to you know that that was our rock and roll and now it seems that uh kids the thing you're doing now instead of starting a band i guess is that you you, you get together one one is the artist one is the coder one is the composer and stuff and you make a game i guess right or you, you write it on your computer yeah you know yeah you just but so 
of course there's still young bands and tons of them but just right 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 at the time when we were doing it it was not the thing to do but a, a main thing for kids to do i guess so and then there would be these youth centers and stuff in around town and neighboring towns where the we kids ourselves would uh, arrange shows you know with mm -hmm. some kind of guiding adult there not a teacher not enough like more youth leader kind of thing mm -hmm. uh so who are you know cool adults <laughs> sure. uh, who, who would help us organize and show us how to work uh, the paper cutter thing for for the posters the flyers and, and everything yeah and help us set those things up and provide a front of house engineer and, and that and you did a lot of that sh those shows and mm -hmm. like i said band competitions which was were you I guys like a heavier band, like one of the heavier bands that were doing these content, or were there other no, metal bands? There were lots of metal bands. I put, okay, you know, like that's all. Uh, the way I remember it, because of the bands I remember, I would say that half of it was uh, some kind of metal, and the other half was everything else, mm -hmm. from hip hop to pop to rock and roll to reggae to whatever you know. Uh, but that might also be a skewed memory because those were, of course, bands we ended up spending more time with and do more shows right. together with. And, mm -hmm. But these were the competitions. Then when we would do our own shows and, you know, put them together, then that would localize that us metal kids would invite each other, the other metal kids to play on our, we would be on, on our, each other's respective billings, you know. Sure. You said you guys got signed, you got signed per, per, uh, per, fairly Pretty early. In, yeah. Yeah. In the, yeah in the, I was, how did that uh, happen? I was turning, I was 19 when we got signed. Um, wow. Well, we uh, made our first demo some years before, and that was what it was. We, uh, you know, it's cute, has its moments. And then we did our second demo, but then we got a bit more cocky. John had started uh, his own label, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, we called it an EP instead of a demo, mm -hmm. you know, and just treat it more seriously. I think, uh, you know, put a barcode there and everything. Oh, wow. And then we felt like, okay, <laughs> why aren't we signed yet? Okay, fuck it. We're gonna, we're gonna just release it ourselves, finance recording this ourselves. And we did a kind of, I don't know, carrying a lot of crap around for other people, I guess. And those kind of, you know, short jobs to, just gather a bit of budget to spend 10 days in a, in a studio, you know, with subsidized prices. And in that process, not, we didn't wait and ask for permission, you know, uh, mm -hmm. ultimately, but in the process we got gain where the label was in, well, it's what this was their studio we were renting basically. And they had seen us kind of grow up and, to be on the journey that we were on so they ended up once the album was almost done like hey we want to release this so that's how we got signed wow and aside from you know the recordings because you put out what four albums with them at least four with albums right? uh, yeah. yeah something five five albums yeah and did they put you on tour or like was that something that you had to still put together yourselves uh Long story short, there is that most of the things we did up until a certain point that was any kind of efficient, I feel like we did ourselves or the driving uh, force behind. But yeah, we got a little bit of tour support and whatever. Mm -hmm. Sure. But no, yeah, we were mainly the engines for what was, um, excuse me, going on there. After signing, you know, signing a record deal is definitely... A, a big victory a big milestone i would imagine in your career what would you say it would like have, in... i guess would have been even cooler 20 years before that you know but, <laughs> but 2006 to sign you know 2005 i guess we we was when we signed and we were so young uh was you know we had already had the napsters and the peer-to-peer mm -hmm. sharing things and gone into i guess no. torrenting was happening at that time already it was yeah. around the corner like and we still didn't have the infrastructure for how to do things online that we have now. And mm -hmm. thus the role of a label was kind of also think between two worlds where it's, um, I just believe that it's only now in the twenties where we really start to put into place what the role of 
other people that the musicians will work with is kind of meant to be mm-hmm. you know um mm-hmm. now that we have a distribution deal with uh 30 tigers what how much more modern and with the times that feels and but it were no modern and with the times in the early 2000s because it was just chaos you know? like wild west right everyone's trying to figure out what's going on There's, yeah yeah tech it's like, was getting totally involved yeah and uh exactly and it was took a long time to kind of catch up with because yeah people were downloading for free you know the mm-hmm. piracy was rampant and we just and to understand for the world to understand how people will not do what's cheapest they will do what's most convenient and price is just a factor of that mm-hmm. like we we all have subscriptions now to different streaming services right and that unfortunately that screws you guys right i mean you can so get like seems, 14 yeah. million streams on a song and like probably not make a whole lot of money haven't checked the exact math on it but i'm aware and and it's also a, a constant pushback for whatever we are getting we're supposed to get less and uh, it's mm-hmm. kind of is yeah you know news flash for the last 500 years musicians are not being treated fairly that seems to be <laughs> news par- yeah but that's just par for the course and you know that right. we we're fighting as well as we can you know as well to- as you should yeah exactly trying to do what we can for it uh with it and stuff and but there you know i guess we are some kind of mid-tier band in terms of success you know i think there is a lot of people who would gladly be in a position we are in undoubtedly Mm -hmm. you know like this is our job and we get to do our thing and not compromise too much about how and when and where and what and and all of that Mm -hmm. uh that being said clearly obviously we're not rolling stones and there are a lot of steps between us and rolling stones you can have so (laughs) mid-tier i guess i guess it's fair to say mid-tier in that sense you know i would say for sure yeah i mean you guys can be a big numbers big you you played a lot of huge shows and yeah but we're we're not the you know i don't take the private jets to to take a shit you know so (laughs) not many people do (laughs) but we're also not we're also not buskers or busking is right right right. so somewhere in the middle and in that sense um uh it's also a position like we don't have all that power you know like it means something when was it taylor swift who went to war against apple and the deals mm-hmm. there at some point out a year and things like that and i feel that needs to happen more in a lot of things oh in music yeah business, that's what needs to happen i didn't kanye do that recently like he didn't put his record oh, up on yeah. spotify or yeah exactly yeah. basically what the what the recording industry needs is what the touring industry had was Led Zeppelin's manager holding people out hanging, you know, in their feet, hanging out uh, on the uh, of balconies, right? You know, balcony railings in the seventies, so that the deals changed. Like uh, on tour, you know, they cut the the artist cut, which is to pay for a lot of more people than just the artists. But mm-hmm. nevertheless, it's 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 eighty twenty instead of twenty eighty. You know, is that right? I didn't know. Realize that's, that. That's, yeah, that's short term. Yeah, that's very the very abridged version. But, but still, uh, I mean, you guys have to pay everybody out the front. Yeah, of but, house exactly. and but the, yeah, but that's what I mean. But, the, yeah, the but that's what I'm saying. That you yeah. get more, you get a bigger chunk of it as a live musician than you get for, as a recording musician. Got it. I see. That's what I mean. Okay. Eighty twenty rather than twenty eighty. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. So, okay. so uh, yeah, and so we and I don't know Kanye and and taylor needs to go and knock on doors and hang people over balcony railings uh mm-hmm. a bit i guess you know for sure and with that you know split with the 80 20 and you know touring is your livelihood i would imagine a big big part of for sure yeah they and, and you know we're a metal band and and i look cute so we can sell t-shirts <laughs> but uh, you know and uh, so that's also a big deal and um, but also something that other artists are being robbed from because they're young and don't know. And then they sign so-called 360 deals where um, where whoever they're working with should have a little slice of everything, you know, mm, uh, as okay. a label. Because they are not, they don't know how to sell music. And so they don't sell music. So they feel they're not making enough from that. So whatever else the artist is good at, they want a piece of that, you know. Sure. Sure. And then feel like, but we provide help and support and service and blah, 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 and develop you in all of these fields. And uh, 
And because, of course, there's always someone in the room other than the artist who supposedly knows better what the artist, who the artist is, and thus what the artist needs to do and what the artist needs to be and stuff. Mm -hmm. You need to, you know, show your the inside of your vagina more on stage and uh, <laughs> whatever, and uh, do, you know, blow this, blow bubble gums. <laughs> right, pop, right. You know, yeah, no, whatever. Sure. So, and, um, but that again, that has always been the case, uh, uh -huh. you know. Because this you... is this is so much fun, and you do is a labor of love, mm -hmm. and it's something you get going with very young, and it's also so it's a pre business that preys on the young, mm -hmm. and that's why it takes all those years then to to get things right, you know. Like uh, suddenly, you know, Metallica weren't on Spotify forever. Uh -huh. until suddenly there's a label called blackened records run by metallica themselves and now they're on spotify you know right it's right a, it's a war you can wage if if you are successful enough in your 20s you might be able to wage that war in your 40s and 50s you know but not a lot of people are being are able to do that right if you exactly. want this to be your livelihood you kind of have to kiss the ring and, so to speak right yeah, <laughs> yeah or that, that's what it feels like and that's what it yeah. seems like many times at the same time I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what I was even going to say about it. You, uh, yeah, you don't have to kiss the ring. It's you're, you're just being told that you have to kiss the ring. Like that. that this is oversimplification. Uh, there's we have. There are a couple of rings you end up kissing anyway, you know, because there are monopolists <laughs> right, in this world. Uh, no, but all in all, like you can. You know, internet turns certain aspects of what we do to make it more democratic, mm -hmm. especially if you are the best, you know, and I don't know who's the best, but some people end up being that. And, you know, then you have all these viral marketing tools if they're just dealt with the right way, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like how nowadays, of course, there are 360 deals for content creators on YouTube as well. And now you prey on that those dreams of the young instead but that being said it's also something that over and over again happens organically with the people who have the newest coolest most exciting ideas and not just trying to copy the last thing you know mm -hmm. and that happens all you know over and over again as well and i sure i think probably younger people you see it okay what they spend their time doing the kind of people with these kind of dreams of fame and glory or whatever you want to call them or a creative outlet that's it's you know there are tons and tons of musicians oh as there always were there of course but now they're they are mixed up a lot with different other kind of content creations i guess you know mm -hmm. social media people uh but i guess they are more savvy some of them I like to believe because of the kind of content they've grown up following and looking at and like Oh, oh, I can make my own T-shirt and sell it, or you know, right, be a bit right. more self-sufficient, be your own business in that sense. Then mm -hmm. again, I'm sure that behind the scenes, all those people. <laughs> oh yeah, if you, <clears> you look know. at like the biggest YouTubers, they're they're not just like, you know, shooting the video themselves and then, mm -hmm. you know, doing a couple edits and throwing it up there and getting 14, 15 million subscribers. I mean, no. maybe they maybe they built a quick little fan base, but once somebody it's just like spotify numbers if that if a label yeah. sees that you have a five million plays on a song and you're an independent artist they're going to be like oh who who the hell is this yeah, hey exactly. yeah it's like you know with 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 the data and in, in, in real time and in, in, in real numbers it's a lot easier to kind of pick and choose who you want to work with with especially mm -hmm. these big big brands and big companies but mm -hmm. um with that well going back to to what we said about touring and and how that's a big livelihood of, of what you guys do like how did like where were you at when this coronavirus happened and were you on tour when that all everything kind of shut down yeah we were uh we um so we went out on a little well we did three dates in russia mm -hmm. uh, it's an opening band and we went out 
kind of starting to understand, but only for real while we were out, like all the cancellations and shutdowns and stuff happened in those, <coughs> excuse me, mm -hmm. three, four days or whatever. Like yeah, a lot quick. of- quick. Yeah, once it, to be fair, like prior to this two months before I've spoken to people like, oh, I'm worried about traveling to Sweden now from the States, whatever, uh, because of this virus in China and like, I had flashbacks from SARS in the early 2000s. Like, hey, get out of here, this wine flu. We're going to be fine. You know, this is right. You know, and I was very wrong, obviously. Uh, so, no, so we were in Russia, and then the news of like that things are going to shut down and airports going to close, and that this and this and that, like so mid March, uh, I guess, is happening. And I. I was so the last year I've been in St. Petersburg and we stay at the hotel by home the day after. Uh, I live in Finland now, the other guys live in Sweden. Mm -hmm. And so I, I go alone to the airport at a different times than the others, and it's really empty and dead. Uh, so you can tell something's going on. And I am on one of the last flights out going to oh, Finland from St. Petersburg, which are pretty close to each other, you know, like it's. Uh, um, so there would be many flights usually mm -hmm. um but it's still you know but still it hasn't really set in exactly what's going on because because you can see the guy uh, you know the security check a guy there at the um you know the bags passing him by and he's looking at he's sneezing into his hands and oh. and bit, you know, like, oh yeah Fuck, coughs, in your, coughs in your face right yeah and i don't think <laughs> that would have die. that person would be masked now also also in st petersburg you know right uh i presume so yeah and then things shut down and uh like again the first show was kind of happy go lucky and then i guess we had a travel day and then we had because i think we'd start over yeah the siberian show was first i guess so novosibirsk then, which so halfway through Russia, and there's plenty of Russia, so halfway oh, yeah, far, it's far, you know? yeah. And uh, and then I guess Mos yeah, there must have been Moscow and Saint Petersburg last, you know, so all the way to the east, and then travel back west. And we're not thinking so much. Everything, everything is happy go lucky in Siberia. In Moscow, we kind of you know go out for dinner and talk, and kind of feel hmm, is world ending. <laughs> is this bad <laughs> right right <laughs> and and start to understand that we need to make certain decisions like the album was supposed to come out in may and like can we release an album <laughs> and we oh was and, hunter gather a complete prior to covid yeah uh yeah oh, okay it was and it was scheduled well it wasn't it was penciled in for may and that was okay. a problem like but then the labels and everything, you need a certain lead in time to get all mm -hmm. your ducks in a row before the release date. And we didn't understand what was going on in the world. So until like, so we had to push the announcement of the release until we had got into that lead in time where it's like, okay, now we have to move it, push it forward. Mm -hmm. And then again, we are not Rolling Stones. Okay, so it has to be after, you know, end of summer, right? Than right, the middle of, of that. So it was never on the table to actually really wait for it, but we lost that lead in time. So we had to push it. And those kind of talks start to happen in Moscow. And then St. Petersburg, you know, you look out in the audience and you know that, okay, this is going to be the last time in a while. Wow. What was that like trying to, did you, like your mindset and the performance, was it any different? Like, okay, like, we need a not that you don't bring it all every show, but like, was there a different vibe in the air, knowing that maybe this might be the last show for a while? Uh, before and after, uh, more than during, because then you're okay. you know, doing your job right. Uh, it's you should lose yourself in that, you know, mm -hmm. in those moments. Hopefully, uh, I just remember saying like. Okay, we're after our thank you, blah, blah, and Russell J. Enjoy the rest of the evening, something, something. Wash your fucking hands. See ya. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. Uh, and, and then hold. And, uh, you know, and then all of this kept happening for a long, long time. Sure. And now we are here, what, like uh, almost two years later, a year and a half later? <laughs> yeah. Still. Well, well you have well, some, you have a big tour on the, on the books. 
yeah, we 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 did tour. We had to cut it short uh, because I got COVID. Well, you know. Oh my gosh. Were you one of the? Were did it really knock you out? I've talked to people that were like done for, and then some people that were like, "Yeah, I didn't even know I had it," but apparently, I kept testing positive. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I felt I had it, and it was because we had had a normal cold at some point during the tour that we tested and tested, like our bus had it, and we tested and tested and tested, negative, negative, negative. We're all fine. We just have this normal tour snuffles. Mm -hmm. Parents shouldn't be allowed to tour. They bring death with them. Uh, <laughs> Parents shouldn't be allowed to tour. <laughs> oh, but you know, like this is snuffles. Uh, I, I don't know if that is how, how it came there, but you know, the tour, right. typical sleep on a bus, everyone gets sick. And then I kind of, and that kind of is hard to shake because you still, you do the shows, you work out, you do everything, you push yourself and you can sleep when you're dead. And at mm -hmm. some point though, uh, this cold started to wait off and I start to, you know, I'm feeling, oh, my back hurts a bit. I'm a very tired. I guess I'm getting burnt out a bit from the tour now. It's, we've been out longer than we usually are. Plus mm -hmm. it's been a while. And then wait a minute, this is not the normal backache. What is this ache? Hmm. I should test just to, you know, I should yeah. test. Yeah. One is, you're supposed to test. That is fine. But I, I should test. I'm tired. I'm tired. Oh, positive. Huh. Everybody get out of the room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, because we tested on a day off in Las Vegas. Uh, so, and right before that, because again, this cold and not feeling as bad as I thought I should feel. We had done this stupid thing as like me biting into the wrong cookie and somebody else eating the rest of it or lying right. on the same hotel bed watching uh, the same uh, watching the same film on, on, on my laptop and things things like that were done i still was the only one who got it uh, that's good yeah and okay feeling like crap uh, but very manageable crap uh, vaccines are brilliant like that you know i guess that's because that's the only thing i did i didn't take any other medication i took some nyquil in the mm -hmm. evening and that's all i did it was food hydration rest and being vaccinated that's uh, good that it didn't really cry i mean it sounds like it sucked but obviously it didn't yeah like... it sucked but it was psychologically it's i guess the interesting part because you know far away from home in a hotel um mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like an American prison. It's nice and cushioned, but it was a Norwegian prison, maybe, you know, uh, but a prison nonetheless. And actually, Norwegian when I started in prison, we, they have the best in the world. Yeah, I know. I've seen a documentary on it. It's crazy. Which is why, you know, in Scandinavia, we have way less people heading back into crime after their sentence because just, you know, with really hardened criminals or real proper, uh, you know, psychiatric. It's like uh, medically speaking, uh, crazy monsters. Uh, it's, it's it's trickier, but for most for most people, rehabilitation is uh, superior. So mm -hmm. a nice Norwegian prison, uh, but still, you know, couldn't go anywhere. Uber eats outside of the door. Uh, I know everything about vegan food around the strip now, and uh, <laughs> and, and you know, depression is a very very big word. Uh, obviously but it was something psychologically sure. it was something and finally start to test negative and going outside was something you know when when again when the las vegas air smells clean you know something's going on with you <laughs> like it's uh, so yeah. it was uh yeah it was mm -hmm. something and yeah that i was when i was recovering like was almost the worst part like it's again mentally because mm -hmm. in the beginning, like, okay, I'm on the bed. I feel like shit. I've done this before in my life. Doesn't matter what the illness is called. This is what you do. You lie here, you watch cartoons, and uh, you nap at random hours. And you do that, you know. But then you have the recovery time when you start to feel better, but you still can't go anywhere. And it still start kept showing positive. Positive tests, yeah. Yeah, and uh, then a difference, uh, you know. And even if i start to feel really good it's like i'm not gonna get on a plane without negative tests you know i'm right yeah, it's, there's no it's, point not safe no, it, for everyone else right yeah exactly <laughs> and and because the thing is you you are really a comparison really way way less contagious at the end of it anyway 
Mm -hmm. And once the symptoms have subsided, because you can show false positives forever, especially with, you know, the PCR tests that I guess are more, you know, discovers more, uh, more secure in that sense, but also can show false positives for a longer time. Oh, so, interesting. I didn't know that. So there is at some point, there is that you're not sick anymore. You just have, mm -hmm. you know, your immune system didn't hide the bodies of these <laughs> things they killed well enough for it to not show up but it's like mm, i don't really want to fly home before right. you know, also you know, i don't want to even risk bringing anything home to the wife or anything right right so there were those days of frustration there you know like mm -hmm. i want to get out of here but i can't and can't. then the you know then the negative test and then another negative test came and hip hip hooray i'm out you know <laughs> so you had a quarantine in vegas sounds yeah. like yeah. Oh, wow. So between that and another day off we had and a show we had there and stuff, I ended up spending two weeks in Vegas this year. I didn't, I didn't, I'm not that kind of guy. I didn't know I was a two yeah. weeks in Vegas per year kind of guy. There you go. <laughs> now you are. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about these two new songs you guys put out, Going Hunting and uh, Sustain the Hollow. When did you start writing those? Oh, uh, I don't know. We songs certain songs we keep writing for years and years mm -hmm. so they were in the pipeline for a long time but you know finalized during downtime in the recent year or so um and yeah i was gonna say Go was ahead. the recording process any different or were you doing it or at this point where stuff opened up enough where you could get into a studio together? yeah no no we could do we could do it our normal way you know okay that's good you know you still work within your own bubbles and all that uh no what's so what do i even say about them i just liked the thing of to me it felt like a beatles thing to have hey here are two crazy cool songs mm -hmm. I, you know, in, not in the context of any other songs, you know, like it feels like a uh, strawberry field, Penny Lane, double A side kind of release was my big takeaway from it uh, to release them like this. And of course, being uh, the marketing, my, I swear I'm not a Coke. My nose is just really itchy. I feel like I'm sitting <laughs> like this. I swear I'm not on Coke. <laughs> no, but I, I can't, like, I start, ah, there. Okay, now it should be done. I think a piece of hair was touching oh, the nose yeah. for too long and uh, now i couldn't stop i couldn't not think about the itch now it's better uh, that's good <laughs> what was i saying about it double a side beatles vibe and also to be the branding marketing geniuses we are that the tour was named going hunting we mm -hmm. had the song and the title before but then it started to fall into place where it was kind of fun to all the trailers that had little electronic music and stuff or pieces of the song we had showed more and more of that leading up to this or without explaining that it was a song mm -hmm. and then on the first day of the tour boom here's the music video oh that's rad yeah that was that felt cool and the video is really cool well thank with you the animations and mm -hmm. the black and white and mm -hmm. uh, did you guys come up with that idea yeah, it's a shared effort between us and uh, and Yuan Kalian that we had done videos with now for it since uh, Black Walls, the Black Walls days. Um, that was a shared effort uh, of putting together. Well, one big part of it is, of course, uh, Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis, and uh, but just almost a fan fiction version of that, as there is the. Um, moment of what would be the word not retribution maybe redemption at the end mm -hmm. uh, and that you get some kind of comeuppance and that there's a second chance at things and evolvement and i guess that kind of idolized picture like you know in metamorphosis um of course this kid wakes up being you know, is it a cockroach in english or mm -hmm. some kind of bug a beetle yeah. it's a beetle or a cockroach i don't remember but uh, um i guess it's a beetle uh anyway whatever uh and it's so of course becomes this outcast and black sheep of the family and a problem and it's hurtful and it tries to help this kid but they don't understand how to help 
and how to understand and love and accept the kid what it is and stuff and so of course there's layers of symbolism there for for, for different uh, you know uh, illness it could be any kind of mental illness or whatever in the family mm -hmm. or just being at different wavelengths with people and it's of course it's, and you know with this uh, bug dying and uh -huh. the family being relieved that is over with and this embarrassment and pain is now gone you know it's, it's sad like that that it's uh, suddenly you're become a pariah within you know it, in your own home mm -hmm. and that's awesome to read, but it's a very also bummer. <laughs> and when looking at life, then we have a more idealized, us the heavy metal version of that idea, where it comes to a more idealized idea of like, okay, so you get this inner darkness uh, that that is not accepted, that is you know that makes you that have that makes it a risk that you will become victimized out in the world and take advantage of or shunned or or anything along those lines and but there is like you can outgrow this you can rise above this you can become a better you know a stronger version of yourself and it's painful and it's hard and it's scary but you know you can come out of your own shell and, and spread wings and it was also perfect then that uh, this year was the year where or how do you say it in, in English? Uh, cicadas? Is that how you say it? Oh, cicadas? yeah, the cicadas. Cicada. The cicadas, yeah. Cicada. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Those it's things are, cicada. Those are uh, something else. I, mm -hmm. I never really experienced them, but I moved from Southern California to Nashville, Tennessee. And mm -hmm. this was like, of course, the year that the cicadas came out. And, oh, man, mm -hmm. those things are loud. Yeah. <laughs> I had never experienced that in my life. And of course, so this so our we don't have a beetle or cockroach. We have a cicada okay, in the music video, cicada. which is why you know it kind of hatches out of itself and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Has, grows wings at the end, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, that's you know hopefully that is you know just a, a a more hopeful version of the ideas of of Franz Kafka, you know, building on like if your family treat you like that fuck them man. <laughs> right <laughs> exactly well i love man i love the songs the, the record that you guys put out this last year is incredible and uh best of luck on this huge tour you have coming up thank you very much and i appreciate your time today uh, i have one more question for you i want to mm -hmm. know if you have any advice for aspiring artists uh probably many um but in my one thing okay for life in general if you're willing to risk things and bet on yourself and what you want to do i guess is um something jim carrey said out of all people i remember because he grew up they were poor at some point in his upbringing and stuff and his dad was i think an entertainer or something like that or mm -hmm. an aspiring one but for the sake of the family, he, you know, got a real job and got fired and they struggled. And it was kind of this thing like you can fail at things you don't want to do as well. So you might want to, you know, so that. So you might as well aim to do something you actually want to do. And. Uh, and for those reasons. Yeah, I, I guess when it comes to doing artistic work and be doing music, doing show business, I guess it's to figure out what that means to you and what it actually is that you want to do. Because, yeah, I want to be a so-called, you know, song and dance man up on the stage. I love show business. I love the circus. You know? mm -hmm. uh, I love the traveling circus lifestyle. However, and I, you know, and I love playing music. I love making music. But for me personally, uh, doing this, I guess I'm only interested in doing it under very specific uh, circumstances, which is like, uh, I want to be a, a performer of my own material and our own material collectively with a band. Like I want to write, record, release and tour our stuff. 
that is where my love for this profession is um where and and that is that's me and that's one way of doing it and there are so many different ways of doing this and none of them are wrong none of them are you know more or less dignified than the other there are all professions and if someone wants to pay you to do the thing you want to do that is just as honorable as any other work within culture entertainment the arts you know mm -hmm. uh but you need to know because there are many ways many different ways of having what on paper would could be defined as success but if it turns out that you don't want to be there but you tricked yourself that you want to be there that is when you become an alcoholic that's when you go on drugs that's when you're depressed that's when you cheat on whoever is at home waiting for you that is when you start hurting people and hurting yourself because everything because i am doing the thing that i want to do then i end up liking everything about it uh, you know that means that i like the smell of farts in bunk alley of the bus that <laughs> means that i like um uh, my highly evolved uh, microwave cooking skills from all those years on the bus um <laughs> That means I, I find it kind of cozy to be in taxi and the, at the airport, you know, mm -hmm. uh, stuck at the gates. It's all everything because I feel I am on my way. I, I am where I feel I'm supposed to be in my own mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that comes, I guess, ultimately from the music, first and foremost, and who you are doing the music with. So, the, you know, th those things matter because yeah because otherwise like i said you end up otherwise this 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 life can be a great and rich exciting one which will give you the privilege to see and experience so many more things than than most people on this planet get to do you know but if if the if you taint it too much with uh, other things and you, you try to live somebody else's dream than your own you will end up hurting yourself because it comes with a price. Bring me